One of these is, is their own color, so that's, you know, that's right, that's what we want. Now when we click on gender, it's going to color code the uh, distribution bars uh, to tell us how many, uh, what the gender is and how that relates to class. Uh, so we'll take a look at, um, uh, this one is at risk, so cyan is at risk, and uh, uh, blue is honors, and red is normal. And so if we go here, ah, we can see this value is quite high, cyan, uh, uh, for female. It's actually quite high for male, too, as a percentage. Ah, OK. Which part do I have? How many bars do you have? Oh, uh, here. Yes, sorry. This is, you, you click this drop-down box here to set which is going to be the attribute that you're trying to predict. You can actually try to set, set that to male, female, and say I want to predict. Tabulate. Essentially, it means cross tabulate. What's going to be the cross tabulation variable? If you put the class one, you get the, what the tabulate space is showing you. You can cross you know, gender and citizenship, whatever. Right. Now, we, we'll, we actually, this is special for building the predictive model um, in a moment because it transfers over to the classify tab. Yeah. So did everybody get that? If you just click this drop down, that tells you which classes it we're going to try and predict. Um, today we're going to try and predict, we'll just start with gender, or sorry, grade, uh, choose grade, and then it'll show you all, as you click through these other attributes, it'll show you um, the distribution based on, on whatever your predicted values to grade. So if we click on gender, we can see something interest, a couple of interesting things about gender. First, our data set is fairly imbalanced. We have 215 females and 44 males, so that's you know, a, a, um, a consideration. Uh, but we can see the kind of distributions across the three different classes. We click on citizenship, we see, wow, really imbalanced uh, data set. And uh, you know, at, at a glance, you can't really you know, tell much else about it. Uh, student ID. Um, who knows what this even means? So in, in, in Weka, the student ID is just, uh, that, that I imported is just some random number the university uses. Um, so actually, you can just click the box and click remove. And so that's how you drop an attribute um, from Weka. Yeah. Yeah. Um, then we have college, we have three different letters, uh, E, C, and F, and you can see the distribution for the, uh, the, the oh, sorry, you, you might have to change that class attribute back. There's actually a trick in Weka. By default, it always expects the very last attribute is your class attribute unless you tell it otherwise. And so if you can manipulate your Excel file, your CSV, so that's always true, um, you'll come up ahead. Uh, I kind of intentionally did it so that that's not true, so that you get to see it. So this is kind of interesting here, just looking at our data, we see that this, this um, college, F, let's call it fine arts, um, has kind of three different distributions, and um, uh, it actually has a fairly, even though it's, it's the biggest college, it has the smallest number of dark blue. Uh, and so if we jump to grade, dark blue is uh, probably honors. So here, it seems that um, the, the correlation of honors with uh, fine arts isn't, isn't strong, whereas this uh, other college here, E, let's call it engineering, um, there seems to be some, some correlation. Um, and that just really just you know, demonstrates what we all knew. Engineers have it easy in life, and artists uh, have it rough. Um, but uh, what's, what's interesting about here is, remember I said that we have missing data as well. And so Weka actually tells you how much data is missing. And so we actually have 17 values of college um, uh, where there was no data. 7% of our data set is missing data. Um, and so Weka with J48 actually works quite well with missing data. <coughs> uh, we're only missing data is blank. Perhaps minus 9 is blank. No, because that's data. That's a minus 9. If you're in the minus nine college, it's not going to take you. Yeah, so that's actually really important. There's a lot of uh, a lot of people have um, um, kind of shorthands for coding missing data that's often used. And actually, so I first ran into this when I was working with people in our teaching and learning uh, center, 
because I never thought nine, minus nine or minus one or whatever would be missing data. I just thought that's data with a negative value. And they did that. So I came up with all these results, and they said, yeah, yeah, yeah no, all the, you know, there is missing data, but it's all coded right. And I'm like, okay. But we had different views on what coded right meant. Um, so indeed, if, if you're bringing it in from a CSV, uh, it definitely has to be um, just a blank uh, in there. There are filters, though, to do some of that processing for you. And people build up filter chains in Weka and just apply them to their data sets kind of, uh, several times. And uh, so that's, it's definitely something that you can do in Weka if you already have another tool kit to use. Um, lots of people do it there, too. If you start to use Weka more and more, then you can start to choreograph these things. Um, and it's on that first tab. I don't even know how to get to that. First tab without being on screen. But it's on that first block that had the little Weka bird on it. There's four different options. One of them, I think, is called Knowledge Graph or Knowledge Explorer. And it allows you to kind of take chunks and tie them together and run a process all the way through it. Another pop popular toolkit that does this is Rapid Miner. Um, although I don't know rapidly. Okay, so we dropped student ID. Um, we've seen the unbalanced data. Um, okay, so we could also, remember you can set this class to like be able to predict whatever you want. So if you want to predict what somebody's gender is and see the distribution uh, based on that, uh, you can do that too. Um, but let's keep it in uh, predicting grade. This seems to be uh, very common. Uh, okay, so now we actually want to classify. Um, click on the classify tab up at the top. You see something very similar to the cluster uh, interface. So there's lots of different classifiers you can use if you click um, cluster, uh, or not cluster, did you click choose, sorry. Uh, there's lots of different ones you can use. Uh, popular Bayesian functions. Um, the one I is that's my go-to for ex explanatory as kind of a good starter is the J48 uh, tree. So click that here. Um, you configure it the same way by clicking on the, the label. There's lots of different. Um, so as you get more and more into this, you'll want to read more and more about how the algorithms work and ways that you can mani manipulate them. Uh, one is this confidence factor is very good um, in, in, in determining. You don't, it's almost like the, the clustering problem. If you have a, a really full tree, you might overtrain and everybody kind of falls into their own little rule and you don't necessarily, you, know, you don't want that usually. And so confidence can tell the tree when to, the, the tree that's formed when to prune and move up and down. Um, this, uh, this one is really good too, min, num, odd. That's how many people should it consider are in a node uh, before it makes that node real. So what's the size of the, of the leaf node? Um, uh, number of folds is kind of how many times do we run it, seed value, uh, so forth. So there's a lot of different uh, values. Um, we're not going to set any of those, I don't think. Can my notes say? Let's see how well that works. Uh, we'll set this class value whoops, to grade. And then uh, we just hit start. The little birdie should get up and dance in the bottom right hand corner. Again, the more you shout out for your computer, the faster it dances. Um, and then this is, uh, this is the tree that's created. And so uh, here are the rules. So if W0 is 0 and college is E and gender is F, then we're going to predict you'll be an honor student. So in our world, that means if you didn't, didn't watch in the first week and you're an engineer and you're a female, then we're going to predict your honors. And um, 15, uh, 51 people that we put in that classification were correctly uh, put in that classification, and 15 were misclassified. So 15 matched this rule, but actually weren't honors. Um, if your gender is M, though, we're going, and those things are true, we're going to uh, uh, put you in at risk. And, and here we just see we have smaller numbers, so 11 and, uh, and 4. Now, um, there, there are decimal points because uh, we run this um, in, in, a, in a method called tenfold cross-validation. Cross I actually didn't mean to do that. So just ignore the decimal points and round it for the panel. Uh, just to kind of, yeah, so that we don't chop people up. That's not, I agree with that. Um, so if, if your college is C, you'll be an at-risk. And if your college is F, you'll be an at-risk. And here it says if you actually watched in the first week, you, you get honors right away. 
Um, that's how you can tell it's a synthetic data set. That's definitely uh, not So it gives you the size of the tree and the number of leaves of the tree and kind of describes those, uh, those uh, methods for you. But we also see that there's a, a variety of different measures of detailing accuracy. So this alludes to our discussion that we had before. Um, so how many uh, uh, classifications you got correct, how many were incorrect, the kappa statistic, mean absolute error, and so forth. Um, ROC area is quite commonly used, same with precision recall. Um, it, a lot of this comes down to what you're using it for. When I just want a rule of thumb number to say, is this better than that? Um, I, 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 I return to the this value here, which is 0.42, which actually has no real world value of good or bad. It's just a way to compare my two models that I created. However, we can go down to the confusion matrix. And the confusion matrix is uh, really valuable in understanding how you got it right or how you got it wrong. So here it says A is an honors, B is a normal, and C is an at risk. And we classified a bunch of people as A. Uh, 73 of them actually were A, and 19 of them were actually at risk. So that's kind of a two category jump. So if, if our rule is to do nothing for people that we classify as honors, with this data set, 19 out of about 100 people will actually turn out to be at risk. What is our duty of care? And so this brings in, I think, a really nice dimension uh, that computer scientists will often not be considered uh, when doing learning analytics research, and that is how does accuracy um, affect what our intervention is going to be and what's an appropriate intervention. And I think that there's huge opportunity for publishing on that issue in the learning analytics literature. Um, same with at risk. Um, when we predict people are going to be at risk, we actually have a pretty high accuracy. 100 of the people that we predicted who were at risk were, but actually 17 of them uh, ended up getting honors. And so if we're forcing them to come to a remedial class and they were going to end up getting honors anyway, is that an appropriate intervention or pedagogical technique? I don't know. Or if you're putting, or if you're reducing the number of credit units they're allowed to take. I know that that's common when you, you know, done poorly in the past, the expectation is you will continue to do poorly, so you put on uh, probation of some kind, and the number of credit units you can take is reduced. What if you were just sick in the first term, and you're no longer sick in the second term, and that exogenous variable hasn't been measured? And that's kind of what this is talking about, that there is some exogenous variable that's not being measured, uh, and then, so there is an inherent misclassification or a classification accuracy challenge. Yeah. One question. Is there any kind of classification method that is for ordinal behavior? Not for nominal, so yeah. take into the account the, the, you know, the, the order. Right. There is information. So one of the problems here is that Weka uh, sees only nominal values, so it says these are all just categories, and you're either in the same category or not in the same category, but actually we have ranked these essentially ordinal, that at risk is below normal, and normal is below honors. Uh, yeah, WEC actually has some uh, filters set up uh, to do that, that can actually do some uh, ordinal uh, tweaking. And you can, you can create dummy variables, of course, from your ordinal values. And so you, just, you create a, a feature for every one of your ordinal values, and that feature is just, the, do you belong to this value or not? Do you belong to this value or not? So then the decision tree can operate on that column yeah, as, is it a zero or a one? Huh? You know, you have one class variable. You know, here, if you done it, you will have three class variables. Yeah. Three, you can do that. Right. Well. Yeah. Okay. You essentially build separate models to oh. predict for each one. A oh, challenge. Okay. Um, well, making sure your data doesn't have isn't missing data in those classification values is important um, because of the way Wecker can do estimation of, of missing data. Um, okay, so another another thing you can do looking at, at this matrix is um, because it's always ABC through ABC or you know whatever your, your classification letters are through your other ones, you can look at the diagonal and you want to find strong numbers along the diagonal. So if the diagonal has all big numbers and then it seems to get smaller on diagonals away, away from it, then you have a, a, a fairly good match. You can use that with Kappa to kind of inform how you're uh, actually making uh, the different mistakes. Um, so 
Now, but I want to show a couple of different ways to do this. So normally, um, if we just wanted to get a descriptive tree, we would actually, in our test options, uh, just say use training set, and uh, we would build our tree, uh, our classification accuracy goes up. And, and so what, uh, th this, this has just run J48 on the tree, um, and, and now he's giving us um, a, a description, he gives us a kappa of 0.50, it, and it gives us that kind of same description. When we do cross-validation and we say tenfolds, what we're saying is, is you have uh, 100 students, take uh, 10 of them out, build the tree on 90, and then test to see how well that tree worked on those other 10. How, what was your accuracy on those other 10? Then take a different 90%, pull 10 students out, and do that 10 times. And the goal of that is to really try and determine how accurate you are or if you're overfitting to your data. So that's kind of a, the, the big challenge with, um, with classification is in overfitting to data. Is there something strange going on with the normal? Um, in each of those, normal is on the guide and on the data? Yeah. <coughs> It's just, it's just a poor fit. <laughs> yeah. It's really poor. You can't get it right. Yes. Okay. I would agree. So to me, what that says is that our data set actually, those, the, 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 yeah, the attributes that we have are actually just separating it into two categories, even though we're trying to predict three categories. Yep. It is weird. Like, if, if I saw that, the first thing I would say is, well, Let's just try and predict two categories and see how we do. And then let's think a little bit about what it means to be normal and what other features do we not have in our model that might help predict that. Because it seems like watching behavior, gender, and college don't predict normal. They just predict <coughs> the ends of the spectrum, the high achievers and the low achievers. Uh, the other thing, actually, if we go back here, um, and we look at uh, grade, we see it's really not a well-distributed data set. And so uh, normal is actually small, when in, in fact, I would expect in a, in a full data set, most people are normal, and then there's a few at risk and a few um, that are high achievers. And so I would question, maybe we should change this data set so that we have a more normal curve distribution. And um, there's a couple of methods uh, inside of Weka to, to do that. I'll uh, maybe even mention these in the slides. Okay. Uh, so the most important consideration when you're doing uh, classification is this overfit. You don't know how accurate your classification system is until you've verified it on new data. And so Carolyn Rose, who's actually uh, from CMU and is going to be here tomorrow, um, uh, she's presenting, I think, in the afternoon on, on the light side, is it called? Uh, it actually uses WECA underneath. She's kind of written a, a new interface on top of it, and it uses WECA underneath. But uh, her view is actually so strong that on the day you publish is when you should try it on that data, and you should put those results in your paper. And you've never seen them before, you haven't manipulated anything, right? You've done all of your training on historical data, and you've, got, you've held out this publishing test set. That takes a, a, a lot of bravery <laughs> to do. Um, so um, when, when uh, I, I first um, gave, gave a talk on a, a new method we uh, had come up with, a, a colleague and I, we tried to apply that to a presentation. And so essentially, we wrote the paper, the paper was accepted. I said, OK, well, we clearly know what we were doing. We, we've done a lot of work on this. So you write the presentation, and I'll just deliver it. And it'll be a surprise to me what every slide is. And so in some ways, that's kind of what that's like, holding out this test set, hoping that actually you found a trend that occurs year through year. There's actually a couple of other methods that you can use to verify this, and um, they weaken your result. They weaken the strength you can talk about it. One is this tenfold cross-validation, where you take out a tenth and repeat. And you could do twenty-fold cross-validation or five-fold. I mean, ten just seems to be uh, kind of a magic number. Um, the other one is this percentage split, and that one's good when you only have one year of data and um, you want to still try and publish on it and um, and do something interesting and and have some confidence in your in your model. 
Um, so inside of Wacta, uh, cluster, you can just say percentage split, 66%. So I want to hold out one third of my data set. I want to train on two thirds of my data set. And uh, this is uh, more conservative than the tenfold cross-validation. It used to be the tenfold cross-validation was enough to get published. You can feel strong about that. It's becoming harder um, um, to get, get away with that. Replication studies are really where it's at. Um, and so, where am I? Classified, sorry. Tenfold, uh, uh, oops, uh, percentage split, tenfold, grade start. And uh, you should be able to see, oh, well, sometimes your kappa comes out fine. That's good. Um, the, the, as I mentioned, the ideal is that you choose use training set, and then you actually choose a completely different set of data uh, from year two, and you test on that. So what's, uh, what we're seeing with a lot of, uh, so MOOCs, for instance, a lot of the MOOC data, there isn't a year two yet, or there isn't many year twos. And so we, you, do, you do that hold out, you, you know, hold out a third of the data, and you train on two thirds of it, and you test on that and try and publish with that. But when it comes to something like uh, STEM enrollment over the last 10 years, if you believe you've found something magic that's been done over the last 10 years, you might hold out two or three years randomly of that data and then uh, test on that. The big challenge is if you're a really active instructor, you're always changing things, right? So year two is never the same as year one. So it's the question is, is it the same with respect to your attributes and the effect that you're, you're expecting to see? Yeah. That random sampling is always the same? Yeah. Or you have a seed or? No, um, I believe you can set the seed, you mean for the, the percentage split or cross-validation? Yeah, I think it's in here. I think you can set the seed for it. Yeah. Percentage splits or cross validation. So you, you can. <coughs> That's right. You can try it in different in, in different ways. Yeah. Uh, the other thing you can do here is you can output the predictions, which is uh, turns out to be handy but a little overwhelming. And I don't know why this doesn't exist. We talked a little bit about this with clustering. Not totally sure why that doesn't exist. Um, but if you do that, then you should actually see uh, for each row in your data set for each. Fold, it's going to tell you uh, what was the guess and how close was the uh, um, uh, method to determining if that was uh, correct. Um, so, what does it mean that it's not making use of the W1 W or W2 and W3? Right. Yeah, yeah, at all. Does that mean it has absolutely no predictive power? Or uh, no, not necessarily. So um, that, that's a great question. So one of the, what it could mean is that there's um, um, uh, not the difference between the attributes. That is, if week zero predicts as well as week one, and only as well as, or, 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 you know, or better, and week one doesn't help with the prediction, then it won't do that. If you, it, it won't use week one. If you didn't have week zero, though, it, it would use week one. And so that actually gets into um, the, one of the other tabs in the record, which is uh, attribute. Uh, yeah. It gets into this attribute selection tab. Um, which can tell you actually how much predictive power there is for each attribute. And it uses different methods of doing this one. CFS uh, sub as subset is good. There's information gain and a couple of them. So uh, there's also the tree is pruned uh, by the leaves um, to try and maintain generalizability. So it doesn't want to put everybody into their own group. So actually, there may be very little correlation or very little predictive power of those weeks. And it would cause leaves of the tree to be of too few individuals to be generalizable. And so that's one of, that could be another reason that it's not using those. Yeah. So there's a couple of, it doesn't mean the attribute's complete garbage. Um, but it could be not as good as another attribute and you know, only gives prediction accuracy in the same way. Um, the key is the algorithm tries to bisect that subspace and choose the most important attributes first. Um, so generally, as you go up the tree towards the root, you get the most predictive attributes, the ones with the most predictive power. As you go down, you get less predictive power. And ones that don't show up don't give you 
enough predictive power um, to be in there. Um, but sometimes it's useful to keep them around because next year's data might have missing values or um, the, the predictive power of some attributes might change. <coughs> data can produce unclear results. Uh, there's different solutions available. So uh, using a vertical subset of the data, so excluding certain categories of users that you don't have enough data for. Uh, so in this example, we could cut out people from a particular college, or as we kind of suggested, maybe cut out all those normal people and just say, well, we're not very good at predicting normal people. You can use a horizontal subset of the data as well, so you can balance groups in the uh, training activity. And there's a method that I really like called SMOT, synthetic minority oversampling technique, that is, um, it's included in Weka. You have to download it as a separate add-on, but they have like some plugin manager thing. It used to be included. I don't know why they switched to this new method. But I really like it because it looks at your data and it says, well, there should, you know, we need to generate some more people, um, and we want people that look kind of like this data, but there's some level of randomness in it. So there's some caveats um, when using that. The big one being that there's an assumption when you're using J48 that there's independence between the attributes. Of course, that's an assumption that most people just ignore and continue with anyway. Um, but it's good to keep in mind, uh, especially when using um, uh, something like Smote. I think it's a really wonderful technique. Um, you can also do um, a subsampling of categories as well. Um, that requires you to have big ends, though. And SMOTE works really well and actually increases your ends with this synthetic data. The key is to make sure that you have a, a test a validation set to, so that you don't get you know, too carried away with creating synthetic data and then only being good at creating synthetic predictive models. Um, uh, you want to keep it kind of real with your validation set. Um, there's lots of other places. Oh, yeah. So this SMOTE is like uh, bootstrapping. Um, no, because you have to have some data already. So you, you, let's say you have 100 people, and let's say we have that distribution where normal is smaller than the, than, than the honors or the at risk. With smoke, we could boost it so that we had the same number of people in each category. Um, and that those ends would actually be, the end would be bigger than our, our entry level end. So if we only had 100 students across the three categories coming in and one had 50 students, uh, and the other two were less, when we smoted it, we would have a, 150 students total, and those three categories would be equivalent. It would be, it's, it's almost like if you consider clusters, it's like putting people in between other people, or near other people, so that they're similar to these other people, not just the centroid, not the thing you're trying to predict. They're similar to other people, but we've kind of added uh, some noise to keep it still really around. It doesn't sound very pragmatic. It doesn't sound like it should be really good, but it, it seems, from my use of it, it seems actually quite strong, a, a strong method uh, of doing this. Um, some of that depends on how much you have to boost your data set. Um, I, 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 really, I think a more rigorous method is to uh, do the subset, right? So you, you, know, you take your smallest category, it's got 25 people in it, and so you just knock the other down, now your n is 75. Um, but actually, the, the most important thing, I think, is that you hold out that test set, or that validation set, because whatever model you built, like if somebody just sat down and said, I think the model is this, if that works best on that validation set, that's awesome, right? It's, that's the model you want to you know, go to war with. And so I think that that's the same with smoke and, and the subsampling. You know, discussions about which one you think is best, but if you've got the validation set, just try them both and see which one works best. And uh, that, that gives you a feeling of how you should uh, move forward, I think, with that. Other places to, to go in your data mining adventure, data cleaning and transformation. Talked a little bit about Python here, but I mean, I, I, we didn't break out Python and talk about Pandas, which is a, a Python library, and Scikit-learn, which is a machine learning for Py Python, and IPython, which is a notebooking tool, and so forth. Um, so there's lots of places to go there. And uh, yeah, I mean, and there's enough Excel wizards. That there's interesting things there, of course, too. Uh, attribute selection. So this I find really fascinating. This is how do you how do you determine which features you actually want in a model and how those features relate to one another, 
Um, and, and so that's uh, you know another tab on Weka, and there's different methods of doing that. Uh, CFS best subset is one. Uh, information gain is another really good one. Uh, balancing of data input and the effects, so that's the smoke discussion. And then ensemble models, and Zach alluded to this, and I won't say too much about this, but the, this is the idea that you kind of generate a diff different models for different uh, situations, and then you kind of federate these or ensemble them all together, so that when you have a new situation, kind of the first thing that you do is you see which situation does it seem to best fit, and then we use that model, or you generate different uh, results for the different models, and then you try and average the results uh, of your classification task. And so it's a really interesting area, honestly one that I don't know um, a lot about, and Weka has uh, a number of tools built in uh, for that. So one of the reasons I kind of toss these up here is that last year at, at uh, the Learning Analytics Conference in March, um, I gave this, uh, roughly this presentation, we, we went through these things, and uh, there was some thought that maybe there should be another one at next year's lab. And so one of my questions that I would love to get feedback on over the week is if you wanted to go further in uh, data mining, first, what did you find valuable or not valuable about, about today, but which, which of these kind of paths are the interesting ones? Which are the ones that people practicing in the field want uh, a better handle on? Um, some of the more learn machine learning theoretical ones, some of the more machine learning uh, pragmatic ones, like the ensemble modeling, and attribute selection, or just the, the, the more general data science skills like uh, data cleaning. So you can kind of think of those, and if you see me walking around, Zach already knows which one he wants. So, uh, actually, I was, I was going to add uh, proficiency models to that list. Um, what models are used in, in practice and in, in education, intelligent tutoring systems, or otherwise, to, I guess predictive models, to yep. predict uh, if a student has mastered a skill, so how to measure learning. Uh, I'm curious for this kind of group and the description of this workshop um, if there's interest in learning about those more domain specific kind of techniques. So you're thinking like some of the ACTAR knowledge? Uh, ACT, yeah, Bayesian knowledge yeah. tracing. Yeah. yeah. Alright, so Zach, you're up. Yeah. Okay. okay, so I think our trusty TAs might come in here. So if you could go download the Harvard MITx data set. Can you just open the room? It's a bit strange when you need to go to the second tab. So <coughs> I've never opened this one. These are facts. <laughs> yeah, it was hard for me. I was like, where is the download link? I was looking at it. There's a second tab with a date, and then you can go. <laughs> That's why. So, let's see on over to that location, if you would. And uh, friendly people at MITx and HarvardX uh, have released a, a public data set um, of MOOC data. It consists of 16 MOOC courses. Uh, between MIT and Harvard. Uh, they were courses that were run between fall of 2012 uh, through summer of 2013. So academic year 2012 2013 <coughs> plus the summer that I think you'll find in the next you know six months a lot of institutions doing this with the MOOC data. It's kind of a MOOC arms race, if you will, to share the data and share the insights and generate the energy around. Uh, Actually, now there is a special a call for special issue for British, British, British General Education Technology about papers just describing, short papers, describing publicly available data sets. So if you made, wrote a paper with some public data set, you can write a short paper published in that special issue, so that will be an interesting issue, you know, just download one one uh, journal issue and you see all the available data sets, so they'll be a, a British Journal of Education Technology, they will have, they have... I just saw it sent to the EDM list today. Uh, it, that, the stuff. that call for paper was like two or three days ago, yeah, very, very short. Zach, is, uh, is Berkeley, Berkeley's up doing it, X. are they planning to Get involved um, with the data release? Um, I mean, I'll be part of the 
submission to that with the, the <coughs> system. Um, I'm, I'm on the committee for data distribution at Berkeley, and I want to push them in that direction. What I'd like to see, though, is a, a full quick stream data release to the public. So the data set that's here um, is not what we call clickstream. It's summative. It's kind of like what Chris is showing. Actually, it's less than tell you that. It's one row per student per course. So if I've registered for two courses, I have two rows in this data set. Whereas the really juicy data, in my opinion, is the one that says, I went to this video at this time, and then I went to this video, and then I answered this question like this. So it's not that kind of information. There's still some value to it. Um, I'm glad they released it. But the question won't just be, oh, well, did they release some move data? It's going to be what level of detail. And um, in releasing this, they decided to be quite conservative about it. And they released it based on five um, anonymity. And an anonymity is, uh, guarantees that you won't be able to uh, identify anyone outside of a group of five. That could be that one person. So that's K anonymity. Um, all right. So uh, people who want the file have it? No, no the internet is very slow. Internet. Um, I, I would love to have distributed this via USB key, but there's this big end user agreement when you download it and it wants you to distribute yourself. Just it's here, right? Can you just walk over to wherever the machine is? Robert X is down the street. So Michigan is also looking at releasing our Coursera MOOC data and going through steps uh, for that as well. Uh -huh. And that's something like 15 courses over six, well, seven sessions now. Something. Nice. So yeah, it definitely seems to be a trend. Good. The, the more the click stream? Yes. Well, that's I'm in the same boat as you, right? That's the interesting thing. Right. So. so I mean, this is good for everybody. More replicable. Um, I'm, I'm tempted to just, I, I think I have this. Um, sorry, uh, the slides are online, um, so please. Where are the slides? Uh, they're on, if you go to the last 2014 schedule and then click on this workshop, you get to a website, and the website's been updated with slides that include this section. Do you know when? Uh, this morning. <clears throat> okay, so <clears throat> there's 600,000 records in this data set. It's big for education data sets. And, um, and this could be in the category of big data. The reason why there's sort of a, a high, there's a very steep learning curve with working with big data is because there's a couple obstacles that will hit you when you just try to build it. And it will often lead to Someone switching to a different data set. That can be open in Excel. So what I want to do right now um, is show for you the two obstacles you will run into when trying to open this in Weka and get you over those obstacles. So you can actually get into the view that Chris had, uh, see the distribution of grades and certificate earners, and et cetera. So the first problem you'll run into is that when you open the file, when you go to Weka, you say, open, open the CSV, they'll say there's not enough memory. So in the file. Doesn't matter if you're on a 16, meg, a 16 terabyte RAM machine, it'll say that. Um, because Java automatically gives you a certain amount of memory when you open Weka. So you actually have to go in there and tell it, um, I want this amount of memory. So if you're in um, Linux uh, or a variant of Linux uh, OS X, you would go to the Weka directory and run it like this. It's java-xmx, and then the amount of memory you want to allocate, here I'm saying two gigabytes is enough for this data set, and then jar web the, Again, this is where the, these guys are coming yeah, in, but I guess, yeah, I guess, yeah, I guess yeah. most of the people don't have the data, no. so yeah. that's too bad. Yeah. <coughs> you have a data and have a problem with that, running it. Um, so assuming uh, that's okay, for Windows, you can go to this link, and it'll tell you how to specify this memory for opening records. And that applies to any data set you want to open that's big, do this. 
Um, when you unzip the file, it, it looks like this. It unzips to a directory called study26147, the identified, and then this long thing about um, CSV. So that's obstacle one, okay? Um, and let's let's do that. Uh, I will go to my trusty webpack here, and I say Java xmx two gigs. And I'm in my Weka folder here. Observes Weka. Um, yeah. You do that every time you run it. I mean, that's. That's Every time you run it, uh, if you're in Mac, you can modify the shortcut so that it, it specifies that. And if you're in Windows, that link tells you how to um, have that be the default on the system every time you drop it. So now I'll open.
apostrophe and thought that was a closure. Um, and as research has shown, and this confirms it, the major the modal background is people who already have a bachelor's degree. Uh, the second most people who okay, passed high school, and then the third most people who have a master's. Some doctorates here, just hanging out, less than secondary, and people who didn't answer. So that's interesting, Zach, on that, because you see that there's a category called NA, um, which you would expect is maybe missing values. But if you look right above it, WEC is also telling us there's almost 50,000 missing values. And so in your pre-processing of this kind of data, you might decide to get rid of the category of NA and just have 100,000 missing values. Or you might decide to encode those 47,000 missing ones as NA. So that's kind of a, uh, an odd thing to be in this kind of data set, but it's very common to find this from your institutional data warehouse, for instance. If you're requesting information from central IT, it's very common to have these kinds of uh, artifacts. But, what is, but is it an artifact? I mean, well, it, perhaps it was in the way the survey was done, so the other right. thing would be. That's right. And the NA actually being the characteristic of a, of a category of person. Right, so some people might not have filled out the survey, so they're missing. And some people might have said NA on the survey, so they're not missing, they're actually NA. But from your perspective as an educational researcher, you have to decide that, what does it mean that they said NA? And is that as good as missing? Uh, or are they really different categories of, of values? Right, and I would ask that question before I can th find it. I totally agree. Okay. Yeah. Here's gender, a little bit of imbalance towards males. Uh, significantly so. Um, great start time, last event, hard to make out stuff from that. Number of events, very long tail. Uh, <laughs> the tail goes to almost 200,000. So there was some user out there who had 200,000 events. Uh, maybe some kind of search engine bot. Uh, number of days active, <coughs> minimum one, maximum 205. Number of played videos, 98,000. Um, so you might want to know, does number of played um, video or number of events correlate with um, grade? The grade that they got was between zero and one. It's between the average of the grade of the material. And that is the by student, right? It's by student, yeah. And are they unique videos? There, there are a number of play events, so you can, there's not many of them. There's definitely repeats. Number of chapters used, number of forum posts. So one question you may have is, do the people who post a lot do well? Are they a higher proportion certificate or some of the people who don't post at all? Uh, do the people who don't post at all, do they, have, do they happen to be more higher level education? Or do the people who post, are they the higher level education people who don't bother to get a certificate but want to contribute? This can be answered with uh, this big <coughs> So um, I'm going to uh, have look at these questions with respect to um, being, uh, getting a certificate or not. Uh, I'm going to apply a numeric to binary. values that are zero puts it in bin one. Any values that are not zero puts it in bin two. This actually works okay um, for these values. So here what we see is the blue is, um, is the number of people who didn't get a certificate compared to the red, which is the people who did. You see a high, there's a lot of CS50 registrants, but not a lot of uh, certifier proportion. This one has a little bit more higher proportion certified as does this seven fourteen seven three is global poverty class of social science social science class. Um, 
So you look at registered, these were all registered users, so these zero non-registered, otherwise they wouldn't use the data set. Um, viewed, if you didn't view it, you definitely didn't get the certificate. Um, explored, again, if you looked at less than half the chapters, you're not getting a certificate. Um, and then, you're certified, you uh, uh, by country, see the United States has a good amount. India, as does Europe, other Africa. Hard to calculate, hard to look just uh, at a glance which one has the highest proportion. <coughs> and then you look at the level of education, and doctorate students barely have any. If, I, I, mean, I don't see any red there. Um, so maybe they're just there to refresh. Um, master's have some, as do bachelors, and the rest. Gender. The grade in the course, a lot of people got a zero grade. Is that highest earned level of education or current level? Because I the doctoral earned, so you're not a doctoral student, you are. You're a You're a that's the thing. Yep. How did you make the grade turn into a binary? Oh. I think I need to Yeah. So, uh, oh, here's the interesting one, maybe. Um, so, this is number of form posts, binary, binary. So, if you posted zero, you're in the left category. If you posted any more than zero, you're in the right. Um, certainly can't tell how many um, posted and got a certificate, but you can tell that the majority of certificate earners didn't post at all. <coughs> so that begs the question, who's, who's posting? And is there enough mixture of knowledgeable, high background knowledge people posting? And if not, how do you incentivize that? So the questions that we could answer just by a very initial cursory exploratory glance at the data, what were the highest enrolled registered classes? Um, were there any students who registered for multiple courses? Ooh, we didn't answer that. Um, so if we look at user ID, it's, it gives the count of the number of times user ID appears. And the number of times it appears is the number of registered courses, because you only get one row per course. So we see some students right off the bat who are registered for 15 out of 16. Uh, and there were multiple courses that were offered multiple times. So in order to register for 15, you had to have registered for multiple offerings of the same course. Uh, so this surprised me. I didn't expect to see numbers above two very often. And uh, maybe they're not very often, but um, they are very strange what's going on here. It's not sorting, but it does seem to be more concentrated at the beginning in terms of students who uh, have more cross-registered. Well, they had excellent offers. They got the early yeses to test it and test every course. Who would be surprised if they didn't <laughs> randomize the order of the user IDs? But maybe they did. I mean, that's an artifact in there. We identify those developers. <coughs> Uh, highest enrolled countries, level of education distribution, we saw. So I did this numeric to binary uh, operation. Um, and then we could answer what were the courses with the highest proportion of certificate earners by I, which is I did. Uh, which level of education produced the highest ratio of certificate earners? Uh, we saw that the PhD certificate. Um, do more students uh, earn certificates who post on the form or who don't post? And the level of education distribution among the certificate. Um, so, <coughs> what I find a little bit awkward when I'm using Weka is when I want to do feature engineering. It's really hard to get that done. Or when I want to do a simple correlation of one feature to the next, R, or MATLAB, or Stata, or uh, these other more traditional statistical packages make that a little bit more streamlined for you. Um, so let's say we want to answer, um, does high course registration correlate with success? 
So are, are the students who register, those 15 registered course students, are they more likely to pass a course than those who are registered for only one? Right? So if you predicted um, certificate by looking at that column of how many courses are you registered for, you know, for each course that they're registered for, um, would that predict any? Um, there's also a confound of time, the violation of time, if you created a feature which was how many courses are you registered for? Because this is over the expanse of almost a year. So really the proper way to engineer that feature would be to go in chronological order with the start time of the course and say for this student and this course, um, how many courses did she register before this start date? And then that's your value for um, the number of courses registered. Then go to the next instance of that student say how many courses was she registered before this date and there'll be at least one now. And so that, that value changes per student for every course they take over time. <coughs> Right. Are students more likely to pass in each successive course they take? <coughs> so if you plotted uh, certificate rates by what number in chronological order was this course that you registered for? Is there a higher percentage of pass rate? Um, what is the level of education distribution among the forum posters? Um, and, and I guess I'm, I'm curious to know what questions come to mind for you. Easier to generate this when you have the data set in front of you. Um. <coughs> well, so Zach, here's one, one for me. Um, <coughs> um, because I've been doing some MOOC analysis as well. And so one thing I'm interested in is what are class-specific predictors and then what are overall MOOC predictors. And we're seeing a lot of people talk about the results on their MOOC data sets, but you know, you know, Harvard and MIT together only have 16. That's not you know, a very wide array compared to the thousands of courses they offer at the undergraduate level. And this has been a challenge. You know, is this just a, uh, the results of, of our predictors? Um, are they just a feature that we're teaching? Uh, in Michigan, we teach uh, you know, only a dozen, 15 different MOOC courses. Is that a, a function of that? No. So how would you approach that question with kind of a single data set like this? Uh, so if we were well, predicting one state, Drop out or yeah, if you're yeah, a like a certificate. Okay. Um, so you could partition the data set by course into the 16 different courses um, and then train a model, a regression or decision tree model, some model that tells you these are the features that matter. Right? Do it for each of the 16, look at the top features, and then do it for all 16 combined, get the top features, and see which ones were shared amongst the top features of the individual. Um, and what it will tell you is um, the exact, kind of exactly what you're asking. Um, what are the general features that predict certificate earning versus ones that are very specific to a course? And there are other methods um, to go about that. Um, but that's one. What's that? Some form of multi level modeling. I mean, yeah, take your favorite <coughs> model building. Algorithm um, to handle that. You can do a hierarchical model, you can do a hierarchical based model. Um, that takes into account the weight of the feature as a global feature versus the weight of it as a local feature. <clears throat> um, and I guess there's also the, there's the question of what are the most important features globally um, versus are there um, model parameters, so model weights for the features that are also global, right? Um, <clears throat> so do you weight when, uh, I mean, I know you use MATLAB <coughs> mostly. I, when I'm building models, depending on what I'm doing, I often don't weight the features. I just use uh, even weighted features across. And this is, uh, can be very challenging, um, because sometimes you might think that gender has a strong effect versus other things. Um, do you have a, a specific method that you use? I mean, do you use mostly Bayesian modeling? Well, I, I mean, for the analyses that I would do on this that um, are uh, in preparation, uh, I, I would do Bayesian modeling of very local learning within a course. So breaking the course down into 
sub-skills and using models of uh, measuring learning to see if uh, we can predict if they get the next question correct or not. Um, and one of the big questions that um, we're, we'll have results for in a couple of days is which courses show more learning than others? Uh, uh, do you see more learning in social science courses versus more quantitative? Um, yeah. I was just going to ask, what are these are measure of So, really loaded question. Um, and we're quite honest about it, which is we're using a measurement model, which is based on the Markov model. So, um, an assumption that you're learning some concept or some low granularity skill like how to carry a digit or how to do the theorem, um, but that this model of measurement is a statistical model that takes in some mapping of questions to a construct. And so these are like short quizzes or tests? There are quizzes, yeah. um, the quizzes and exams and uh, uh, lecture check questions that come out. So I have, a, I have a, a separate question. Okay. Um, in this particular data set, I mean, this is um, an issue that we face right now. Um, we have tons of data across tons of digital products. Lots of users coming in and out of the product. And we're trying to make huge claims about um, the efficacy, the, whether or not use of a particular online content is at all useful for learning, or is it helping teachers, or if they access this video, or, or what have you. Um, and then we have these large categories, like it sounds like you do, where you just have certification or not is, is a good end goal, but um, what are those events? What are those videos? What Which chapter is more or less important? So do you, can you talk a little bit about the challenges of um, capturing that kind of data? and? I mean, I certainly know what our challenges are, but how are you guys addressing it in the environment? Do you capture? Maybe it's more of a quick stream approach that you were getting to, but um, how, do, how do you connect? And it's not a waiting, right? So much as which, which chapter makes the most sense, or which video in which week makes the most sense, so, are the most, um, the best way um, yeah, so that, that's the question I most care about right now in, in MOOCs, is trying to do this kind of efficacy attribution to objects in the course. Right, saying, this video was watched a lot, but didn't seem to help students answer this question very well. Um, and so we're using the clickstream to try to infer that, and uh, I think this is a good time to plug the public session my 10 minute talk there will be almost exclusively about answering that question. Um, so I won't spend too much time here. But yeah, there'll be a, a there'll be click stream and basically we want to know, you know, what caused the student to answer correct here given this was her past history of uh, videos. Um, it's quite a difficult question to answer because it's an inference question and there's also um, there's only so much variability in the, the pathways that students take to acquiring information, it's hard to find a signal in that because it's not a randomized, it's not a controlled, randomized selection of learning objects that are thrown at them, right? If, if you presented them with learning objects randomly, you could do this post hoc analysis and say, oh, yeah, well, we know that this was better than that, but it's not a controlled trial. Uh, I'm sorry to interrupt. Um, I Somehow my connection died and I couldn't get the data. And I also can't find <coughs> these particular slides online. I sat found yeah, one of the videos. Yeah, I can't find your slides on the uh, Yeah, his slides are up. Okay, uh, yeah. we'll, we'll update. Yeah. We'll update them. And I'll put them in that uh, Google Dropbox or whatever. Yeah, Google Drive. Yeah. Cool. Yeah. The connection died and then it came back. I can, I just want to chime in on this. Because one thing know. that I, uh, so I, I often try to create yeah. dummy variables yeah. for uh, the different lectures, let's well, say, because well, I wanted to measure kind ask. of how, how effective the piece of content mm -hmm. was. Mm -hmm. But one of the problems you come into is what Zach's talking mm -hmm. about, is, is the, the paths <coughs> and, and how those paths <coughs> change what it means to, to, to be a piece of content. And so my method, that I've gone to is actually not to look at the content 
but to try and measure effort and activity, to try and measure engagement through interactivity as opposed to content itself. And that doesn't help you. What you want to measure is the content. So like you want to find weak content, or you want to find strong content, or you want to build a recommender system. But you can actually build some fairly quality predictive models just looking at activity when you're doing uh, things like moves. Um, because really, it's activity, it's that amount of activity, and buy-in uh, to, to the movement and kind of ownership of learning that, that seems to correlate with success, as opposed to any particular piece of content, in part because the MOOCs have a fairly low barrier uh, to, to entry to actually get that certification. That might not be as suitable for higher ed or, um, or even for specific kind of learning situations like students learning algebra and so forth. Um, so there's, it's, it's interesting to think of the different kinds of features that you might come up with and what proxies of learning uh, they might be. And we're even, even at a, um, you know, a precursor to all of that in the sense that um, we do have use, usage kinds of data, um, which is what I think you're yeah. also getting at versus the more granular. But even in the usage part, um, if you don't think about it, Ahead of time, and this is kind of you know, so I kind of came to this environment after the fact. And what is usage? What is engagement? The definition is so critically important, and um, I'm hoping that you're going to talk more about that throughout you know, the rest of the event because that, that becomes the biggest hurdle for us is you know, you've got someone like, doing something, interacting with something. Is it redundant? Is it the actual person or not? If you have logins that are shared among users and things like that, I mean, is, it, is it the same piece of, whether or not it's the type of content that you're worried about, but is it the same piece of, that's why I asked the question about, you know, the views, is that the view of the same thing over and over and over again, or is it a view of different things? And so I did, all I'm getting at is the definition of the diagram is so critically important, and we yeah. can't make assumptions even at a high level about. Well, and, and, and certainly, like, if there are multiple logins, I mean, we see people getting certificates and moves without ever having viewed any videos. That seems pretty difficult to imagine. But people come with prior knowledge, or they sit at their buddy's house and watch the videos with them and just go back to, you know, log in when they have to take the exam. So there's lots of, uh, there's lots of nuance and, and muddiness there. Um, so you don't have, like, the golden key? Well, uh, so the technique that I've been working on, the technique I've been working on right now, I wouldn't hold it out as a, as a golden key yet, but we uh, characterize interaction with resources, and then we look at kind of temporal patterns of access to resources. And resource can be very coarse grade, so it could be lecture videos, or it could be very fine grade, lecture video number four. And, um, and then we build a series of um, thousands of attributes and, uh, and, and do <coughs> decision trees based on those. And that has uh, shown some benefit. Um, it's still under peer review, but it's shown some, some benefit for trying to understand those interactions. Um, but uh, yes, how much it, you know, how much more could we push it? The, the big win of something like that is that we don't have a common model, and uh, and and the big win there is that we didn't have to pay somebody to learn everything there is about cognitive modeling, be on our staff, and get involved. And it's not that cognitive modeling is bad; it's just we didn't have that first. So that, I mean, that's an open to me. That's an open research question. Yeah. Um, if you need if you need your cognitive model to be the you know. John Anderson cognitive task analysis, where it's you know three thousand skills in algebra type of cognitive task analysis, or if you can have a graduate student look at the material and say this is you know a learning Newtonian mechanics, and you take it down to the level of this course, this is blah 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 blah. Um, do those more cheaply sourced cognitive models maybe it takes them two weeks um, and fifteen hours? That's that's very doable. Yeah. Um, is that worth something in terms of prediction, in terms of modeling, in terms of formative assessment of your material? Um, and I think there's two questions that will probably need to be controlled for and not confounded, which is um, how good your cognitive model is, how fine grained it is, how accurate it is, how, how much it corresponds to the student's cognition, um, uh, and um, the variability into the system, right? Where are you getting your signal from? Where are you getting your variation and student pathways that can help you at all do that kind of attribution? So it's a big, it's a big question. It's probably going to be, you know, a, a full session at, you know, LAC or EDM and just the very, very future.
your dollar yet, so we can call pathos to learn. We have like two sessions. Um, so this is somewhat tangential, but it was mentioned engagement really hard. What, what is engagement? Um, and there was a SRI, uh, which is used to be Stanford Research Incorporated, but now it's just SRI. They, they're not associated with Stanford. Um, uh, actually, their, their president is an alum of WPI. Uh, and they had a, a NSF building capacity workshop on non-cognitive factors in learning. And they put together at this workshop uh, that I attended a number of different design documents um, based on uh, evidence-centered design, and engagement was one of them. So this is the engagement document uh, written by Sidney DeMello, who's a big aspect uh, researcher. And it tells you about the construct and the learning environment and the data you use uh, typically to measure it, some uh, uh, perhaps seminal publications, uh, the overall importance of the construct being measured, <coughs> and uh, for what purposes the claim or inference related to the construct be used. <coughs> uh, so there's a lot of juicy information here. Uh, primary construct addressed by the design pattern. So this, this um, task model, <coughs> I couldn't help but point you to this because this was uh, an effort to answer this question. What is it? Is this a public document that you can share? With? It is something I can share. Um, you put that in the Google Drive. Okay, put that in the Google Drive. There's a lot on ECD by SRI. I mean, there's tons of task models for all kinds of different constructs. So, I mean, if it's not engagement we're looking for, you know, can really, it's a very intensive process of building a task model, but it's great for at least kind of some pedagogy or um, thought before you start to disengage. Correlations, for example. It's good to, to, to squeeze some thought out yeah. and point to something. Um, when it comes to constructs that are kind of on the cutting edge of how do we measure them, when they're hard to measure, not necessarily <coughs> the best framework for, for addressing that. Um, it, to me, the ECD approach felt more uh, appropriate for. Um, measurement of things that have been sort of decided by psychometrics decades ago, and now they want to think about how to use them formatively. Whereas when the measurement of something is very difficult and the research is mostly focused on how do we measure it, ECD sometimes puts the focus in the wrong place. But yeah, I agree. The key thing is, I think, doing a cognitive task analysis is doing a, what are the constructs that are going on? What are the Yeah, so um, I, I think that's it. I think at uh, 5.15 there's a reception, isn't there? Uh, yeah. I'm, I'm not sure where it is. I presume it's upstairs. No, and no, no, it's new bar. A couple blocks away. Okay, okay. good. Thank you. <laughs> sure. Basically, don't trust me when it comes to questions about the schedule. <laughs> I know that there's something else tonight, but I was told is back in this room, though. And, um, and that's kind of going to be kind of a public, because uh, there's the, the, the Boston Lassie uh, thing going on. Well, um, you know, over the, it's Wednesday or Monday? Monday? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's the first day. Yes. We go two more days. As you see us, if you have uh, things that you want to ask as far as questions, please do. If you have things you want to suggest, because we've now run this uh, twice and, uh, you know, we're always looking at ways of improving it and whether we should run it again or whether we should uh, change the focus or strengthen different aspects of it. Please do that as well. Or if you just have some some thoughts on your own data, a data set that you're working with. Um, so when we were at LAC, one of the things we did in the afternoon is we just hacked data sets with uh, people, and uh, various people brought data sets. And it was it was a good time um, of of exploration. So and then uh, Harry bought us drinks and we hacked data sets some more. <laughs> um, so there's you know if you have these questions, please uh, uh, feel free to catch us and uh, ask any questions. Um, 